So, where's the people? Stop talking about this. So, guys, there are, there are four ways. We want to talk about, about oh, this. For, I, I, yeah, the first one is, is a joke. Oh, okay. that's good. That's good. So, so we, want to, we want to bring, to remember you the, the ways you have failed this class. And there are four ways that the last man said, okay? So the first way you remember is you need to attend a minimum of 70% of the sessions. No, in every class meeting. This okay. included. In, this included. Yeah, every class meetings, including these classes and and uh, seminars from Tuesday, you have to attend a minimum of 70%. So if you in the midterms, if you if you earn an S, if you got an S, it's because you probably failed to attend 70% of the class. You have to <clears throat> We are on time to repair that thing. Nobody is in risk. No, there is no person in risk. Yes. No one's no one's in risk. Yeah. The second, the second, the, the, please remember, listen, listen to all because this is very important. Okay. And tell your friends who are here. Yeah, go tell your friends that you are here. And uh, by the way, so raise your hands if you are in my section. So we're not doing something that gives us their section. In their section, they are formally a they have formally a body. Someone helped you. A body. A body, yes. I, 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 I think it's a good idea. So it's a good idea that you find someone. Come on. I know that Paul and Sean, you know, your, your body is not. But, but my point is that you have, you have to find someone who helped you to succeed. Review your document, your review your analysis, and so, and so on. So but the, first, the first way to fail this class as if you do not attend a minimum of 70% of the sessions. The second, the second form, the second possible form of the class, if you are meant but not to meet 70% of the assignments. So if you come to the class but you do, do not submit 70% of the discussions, assignments, blah, or the analysis. I think it's just, you know. I just analyze. If you, if you fail to submit 70% of the analysis. Okay, guys, we're talking something. Some of you asked us to talk about today at the beginning. So we want to talk about, we're talking about this, the, th the three forms plus a joke of failing this class. The first part, the first form is you do not attend 70% 70, 70 minimum attendance. Second form, if you fail to submit 70% of the analysis. The third form, the third way to fail this lab, and if you submit the material the analysis, but they are so bad. So you are not following the rules, you are not succeeding. I was talking with that with my students that so the the the, the course of, of learning is made, grown so fast this year. So I have we're having several students that are doing really great. So only if you don't read the, the, the instruction very well, you will fail it that way. And the fourth way, which is a joke, is if Celtics lost, don't win this year. So if, if Celtics lost, they don't win the NBA this year, ever will win. Wait, if the Celtics are going to win. Question. If, they, if, okay. if the parade is on one of the days we have class, are we excused? <laughs> <laughs> there will be a substitute sign. Okay. Yeah. So, Mark, the assignment will have to do with uh, photographic analysis of the way human bodies use like space in the street. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh, we can read for this That's a hugely, hugely valuable lesson, more valuable than anything we do. So, yeah. So these are the three ways to fail the class. Any questions about that? Do the do your friends <clears throat> who are not here, do they understand these three ways? Friends don't let friends proceed without understanding these three ways. <laughs> your friend to your friend. And be friendly with your friend them by making sure they understand these three ways. Is coming late okay? Does that count? 
So after ten minutes, ten minutes, it's counted as late. Three lates equals an absence. That's just one way. The other thing about the seventy percent attendance thing is it's so much more forgiving than any official attendance policy anyone has ever seen. That we're not going to, you know, if you're at sixty nine and you say, "Oh, well, I wasn't late that day," I remember distinctly my friend telling me I wasn't late that day. We're not going to talk about that. We're not. The, the deal is, you get a very forgiving attendance policy, and in exchange, we don't nitpick about minutes and you know, one late versus two late. We're just not going to talk about it. If you're near seventy percent, there's something wrong. So, and and I'm going to have to remark to you about the last one. So, we want everyone about six. 16 out of 16 the assignments by the end of the season. Right. So if, you're, if your body is not getting 15 or 16 out of 16, you're in trouble. Yeah, I suggest you to talk with your body, some uh, friend, and say, how are you, how are you doing? You need help, and you can review together the assignment and see what okay. And I think we need to contribute more to this. I think on Monday after studio, is, if I'm a student, I'm focused on studio on Monday. I have no concept of the analysis assignment until I'm done with studio on Monday. Who's with me? Like Monday at the end of studio? Boy, isn't there a thing? Isn't there another class we're taking? Oh, yes, that class in 426 grading. Do we have something to do? Oh, that's right. We have an analysis to do again every week, the same thing. Why are we? Okay. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to look at that at the end of studio on Monday night. Maybe one or both of us will be there to support you. It's the least we could do, right? Is that okay? Is that a good time to do it? Are you able to hang out your studio on Monday to work on this with us? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. We'll awesome. Be awesome. I promise that I will change my hat from studio to this. And if your buddy is getting eight out of 16, Got to support them. Okay. Friends don't let friends lose points on these things. Everybody should be getting 14, 15, 16 scores by now in the semester. And if you're not, let's do something about it. Okay. That's the, the luxury of having the same assignment over and over again. You can get it wrong and then you can get it slightly less wrong, but eventually you're going to get it right. That's what we're looking for. And that's why we set the close up. And, and if anyone <clears throat> wants to talk, also private with, with some of us, yeah. discuss whatever you want to talk about these three rules, please uh, so send us an email and we can talk one to one, even if you are not in our session. Yeah. Like, even if yeah. you are not in our session. Please, Robert, Robert, doesn't see, Robert doesn't seem to understand the he doesn't, I don't, I'm not comfortable. Yeah. Well, so then needs someone with an accent. So yeah. yeah. So I'm the guy. So you need someone with an accent to discuss your concern. Right. I'm here. Yeah, so we've, we've got, got both kinds. Yeah. U.S. accent and Venezuela. Yeah. I have an accent. No, that's not true. This is, this is, this I is say, this, this, all, every time you fall with an accent without practicing that. No. <laughs> I've lived overseas. I, I hear people talking like me. What's, what's that? I hear my own voice. What's that? Okay. Anyway, yeah, what's that? But okay. if you need to you talk, with, talk, talk with someone different, that each of uh, you have to ask 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 we're doing it backwards. Why are we doing it backwards again? Do you remember why we're doing it backwards? Does it make sense? Yeah, why are we doing it backwards? Yeah, and why is it, why is, what makes it the most important stuff? Yeah, exactly. I don't know, I don't know. Why do we think that are more than one? Some smaller aspects of the city. The most, yes, the most recent issues that we deal with that we normally come at the end of the course 
the, more, the issues that have the most, the strongest connection to the challenges you're going to face when you're the boss in 2050. Uh, friends don't let friends not be the boss in 2050. So we hope you're all the boss in 2050. In 2050, when you're the boss, someone, everyone in the room turns to look at you. And what are you going to be dealing with? You're not going to be dealing with polluted uh, rivers in the industrial cities of England because of the Industrial Revolution. You're going to be dealing with the things we started talking about at the beginning of the semester, the right to the city, informal settlements, self-produced neighborhoods, climate justice, race, climate justice, social justice, reparations, uh, and automobile dependency. And so we connect to the moment of truth in your career space. But there's a second reason. Yeah, what uh, That I feel that, that, so this is a history of theory class, and supposedly the things that we're living today Climate justice, right? The provision, the special injustice, and so on, happened because of something happened in the past. Right? It's happening because something happened in the past. So we are now we have we have the questions. Right. So when we when we look at the radiant garden and see beautiful, so we can I we invite you to ask your past us why what happened in this moment of the time that reduced these problems with spatial justice and climate justice and, and lack of rights. Yeah, so how these it. respond to the first question that we got yeah. in, the, in, the first event, in the first weeks that there are challenges that were experiencing. Right. And you may have heard, that you've heard me say this in history theory too. The problems of the 21st century are a direct result of the successes of the 20th century. We succeeded so dramatically in the 20th century that it went too far. Our goal was to give everyone a car and to get them fast on their own, whatever, wherever they want to go, whenever they want to go, to get from point A to point B on their own, empowered individuals. Do we do that? High five, we did that. Oops, we overshot, we did it too much. The other thing we were trying to do in the 20th century, Let's protect property values of uh, the most valuable housing and real estate. Let's protect those property values. We, did we succeed in doing that? Yes, high five. Oops, we were shot. The, the mechanism for protecting property value was driven by profound systemic racism, and we destroyed the property values of significant segments of citizens of the country. So these are just two examples. So when we talk about garden cities, for example, we used to give you the Ebenezer Howard reading, and students would read Ebenezer Howard and say, oh, garden city. That sounds like a great idea. And then they go out and practice, and they do the garden city. They neglect because they weren't paying attention in class later in the semester when we said, the reason we have systemic racism baked into the landscape of the United States is in part due to the enthusiasm around the Garden City as an abstract diagram. So by starting with racism and social justice and climate justice and moving back in history, when we get to these topics, we get to these topics with a critical eye. You are all struggling as young designers to be as good as architects are to live, right? Who's with you? Who's, who wants to be as good as an architect is these days? Okay, is that good enough? If you're no. as good as your bosses in your internship, is that good enough? No, not even close. Not only do you have to understand everything that your bosses at your internship understand, you have to have a critical attitude to where the design professions are right now. And you have to overcome it, and you have to do better. You have to come up with new solutions. You have to do better than simply reproduce the systems of oppression and injustice that, have, that we have inherited. We need to understand everything that a licensed architect understands, 
and more. We have to have a critical attitude to be able to see where the injustices start and where architects can actually enter into it and disrupt and produce positive examples that dismantle the mechanisms that maintain the status quo of oppression and injustice. Is that a good synopsis, of course? It is, it is. So I, I said the first day that we have to be like Neo in the Matrix. Yes, this is like Neo in the Matrix. Yeah. You need to dodge those bullets. Okay, in that context, we continue to look at the world as the number one source of understanding. And if who's, who read the Jane Jacobs reading? The Jane Jacobs reading, if you didn't read it, probably should. Uh, the Jane Jacobs reading is really a manifesto for the 21st century of design practice. And it's really the core document that, that establishes the values and principles that, that this course is built on. So if you didn't read it, you might want to read it. And whatever your teachers are teaching you, take it with a grain of salt. They should be number four. Does that sound familiar? She didn't say number four, but she's basically saying, don't just trust your teachers. You need to look at the world. You need to work with your number three colleagues, your buddies. You need to use the tools of architectural thinking to uh, understand the world better than anyone else does because you're architects and you need to learn the lessons directly from the evidence of the world itself. That's the basis for this analysis assignment. Why do we do what we're doing? We do it because we need to challenge the status quo. We can't afford to just learn from our teachers. We need to learn directly from the world itself. That's where the the true authentic learning comes from. That's why we do the analysis assignment. If you're wondering, that's really it. So based on that, what are your core, what are, what are your burning questions that you need answers to in this, the next hour and a half? Sean? Uh, is it possible to reuse different neighborhoods with the same group of effort that you take the one type of name? Say that again. Um, leave, leave yeah. this the verb? Yeah, leave. Okay. So distinct, <laughs> is it possible to weave distinct communities uh, within, can you weave distinct communities together? Okay, good one. What else? Don't be nice, just challenge us. Make us work. Make us work for it. Imagine you're going out into the world that's hostile to what you need to do. What ammunition do you require to go out into the confidence and to conquer? We don't want to send you out there empty hands. What do you need? <laughs> You think of something during the course of this lecture. We should set up the mentee meter to receive challenging questions. Next week, we'll do it. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm a little shy. I don't feel comfortable hearing the sound of my voice. Next, next week. Okay. okay. So let's do the mentee meter. But if you think of something, shout it out or tell it to your overconfident friend, right? Joe, you can do this. If someone could. <laughs> Someone could probably overpower. No, no, no. It's a good thing. It's not, it's it's an open bandwidth. Right? Was the yelling, um... Yeah. You're comfortable yelling out. We need that. Um okay, so let's so much to cover, so little time. So I have 187 slides, which is double the number I usually have. But on the positive side, you've already seen this stuff. Remember that course you took at that, that spring, sophomore year course, History Theory 2? Remember that? Is that what you got? If you just open your notes, you're going to see some of this. Do you have your notes with you? <laughs> so 
we learn we learn from the world and here's a piece of the world that we know so well and empathy is step number one of every design process even if you're a white male architect you need to do your best to get into the heads of every user the nine-year-old girls is your client, you need to imagine what it's like to be a nine-year-old girl. And when the nine, but at the same time, you need to know that you have no idea what your nine-year-old girl is thinking and you need to be curious and constant. And so here we are, we're in studio late at night and I need to, you know, it's, it's 10 at night and I need to get to Ruggle Station. Who's ever had that? Who's ever been in that situation? I'm leaving studio, I need to get to Rubble Station. Okay. The shortest way to Rubble Station is you pop out this door, you go through here. How many of you go that way late at night? Good. How many of you go out here and then through? I go. So why would you, what are the pros and cons at 10.30 of going through Alice Hayward Taylor apartments versus Northeastern Kings. Yes. What's it? Spooky darkness. Spooky darkness. What else? Um, security. Security. Is that it? Is that it? I mean, this is faster. It's a more direct route. But this is more comfortable. I like walking to the front of the school part of the institution. Right. And so at the core of this is the experience of eyes on the street. When there are windows and the lights are on, there's a high likelihood of people actually being behind those windows. It's safer. Imagine, here's the empathy exercise. Imagine you're addicted to fentanyl, and some humans are. And the fentanyl programs have been canceled, and you're desperate, and so you need uh, you need to rob somebody to fix their phone, right? Where do you do that? Do you do that? Do you do that in here? Right outside of my high five. Right? And why is that? What is it about? What is? What is it about the design of the buildings adjacent to the street that makes it ideal for you to mug some? Right? And what are the conditions? of the architecture facing the street that makes it unlikely that you will choose that location to victimize someone else, right? Which, and we go through this when we choose which route. At the end of the night, I don't walk through Alice Hayward. I walk through uh, Northeastern. Because uh, people love me, they care about me, and I don't want to get hurt because they need me. During the day, I walk through Alice Hayward Taylor because I'm so interested in how the original public housing has been transformed over the years and how they're still facing problems. And to what extent does it have to do with problems of eyes on the street and the lack of a formal street as a room? And then you look at, at Wentworth. Where do you feel safe and where do you not feel safe? If you're a woman, uh, if you're a freshman woman coming to, like, to Wentworth Institute of Technology, your parents love you, they give you pepper spray. You have it on your keychain. Does, does that still happen? Do parents, yeah, we did that with our daughter. And, uh, and so you have pepper spray on your keychain in your pocket, and you're walking down the street, and everything's Great, everything's wonderful. You're, you're thinking about, uh, you know, your friends. You're thinking about uh, uh, Dua Lipa or something. And then you turn the corner. You turn the corner, and you find yourself here. I don't know about you, but I reach just without thinking. I reach into my pocket to see if my pepper spray is there. I just want to know, does that sound right? So where do you reach for your pepper spray? And where do you forget about your pepper spray? 
Here, if I'm, you know, correct, please correct me if I'm wrong. Here, I'm not so secure, but this is worse. All these bushes, all the shrubbery, perfect. Perfect place to victimize someone else. Then there's a big parking lot. <laughs> right? Am I getting this wrong? The parking lot by Watson? There are also no lights. No lights, no people. Perfect. I'm actually going to, if I'm walking there, as soon as I check to see my pepper spray's there, I'm going to uh, try to safely cross Parker and get next to Ira Allen. Are people in Ira Allen home? No, but it feels like safe. It might be, might be clean through something. It cannot be. Just feel safer than the parking lot. Then we get behind Watson Hall. Does that feel safe or not? No windows. No doors. No one's in there. It's not safe. It does not pass the pepper spray test. Then we come in, in front of CDIS. What happens? I start thinking about the Eilish. issue. It's like, okay, I, I don't need my pepper spray. It's all these windows there. Well, it's so good. It's so good. Right? There used to be tennis courts there, <laughs> and it was not safe. But now with this building there, it's much safer. Annex Central, pretty safe. Lots of windows, even if no one's there. But then you get to Tansy Gym. They used sure. to have hedges here. That was the perfect place to, to wait for someone to, to knock down. Right? It was not safe. Why do architects create architecture like this? That's what we're looking at today. Here's an even more egregious example. The client comes to the architect. The architect says, how many employees do you have? The client says, 100 employees. And so the architect says, 100 employees times 350 square feet per employee. That includes the bathrooms, the breakout room, the kitchenette, conference room. 100 employees times 350 square feet per employee. So we need 350, add two zeros, and you need 35,000 square feet for the employees. Okay, and then the, then the architect says, where is this located? How many employees are walking there or taking transit? How many cars do we have to deal with? How many parking spots are? Well, depending on where it is, it's gonna be easy. If it's in the United States, chances are it's gonna be 99 of those people are driving. The only one who's walking there is the CEO because he likes to walk to work. It's a luxury to walk to work. So he locates his headquarters near his house so he can walk to work. So one out of those employees, the one with power is going to walk. 99 are going to drive because they can't afford to live uh, where their CEO lives. So let's, let's just round it off so the math is easy. 100 cars. Let's say there's 101 people in the car. One person walks, 100 people drive. How much space do you need for the cars? Any guesses? How big is the parking spot? It's about eight feet by 20 feet, so 160 square feet for each car, right? That's reasonable. Is that right, though? No, because you need the driveway. You need the entrance. And if you're going on the ground, you need the ramp. It actually turns out, it's 450 square feet per vehicle. And now here's the real killer. The cars, how expensive is it to build a parking lot? Very expensive. How expensive is it uh, to build a multi-level parking lot? About five times as expensive. So you go from $50,000 per parking spot very quickly to $200,000, $250,000 per per parking spot. It's really expensive because it's hard to stack cars. You need all those drivers. It's very expensive to stack cars. It's one of the fun. Uh, how about people? People go up and down stairs and elevators quite easily. It doesn't take a lot of space. It's pretty cheap. So you can stack the people up as far as you want. It's the cars you can't stack up. So you have, you have 
45,000 square feet of parking that has to stay close to the ground plane. Very difficult geometry to work with. But the people, you can stack them up. And if I were smart, I'd show you Dallas, downtown Dallas, again, where 85% of the land area is parking and roads. 15% are these high rise towers. People stack, cars spread. And the more uh, you spread, the more, it's, the more you need a car. So it's a self fulfilling prophecy. This is a very unsafe streetscape. There's lots of places to hide and lots of places. Uh, this does not pass the pepper spray test. It has no windows, um, but forever, uh, but the parking is underneath this, this block. But for this period uh, of the great, the great acceleration from 1950 until now, uh, architects, took on the task of designing buildings to be beautiful works of art, or a big part of this stuff. Beautiful works of art. With these constraints, spatial constraints, volumetric constraints. And so this is a natural outcome of a very few number of factors that work at the center of what, what the architect thought was their job. So it's very important to understand how architects were making decisions during the Great Acceleration, speaking optimistically in the past tense that we're over that now. And to understand it, to grasp it, and to fulfill all of those obligations and then more, and do much better than this. That's the challenge. And what you're doing in Helsinki, uh, it's a little bit easier because it's in Helsinki. It's not in the United States. They have a mass transit system. So a big, a big theme of this week is planning. What is the problem with planning? What is the problem with the world that planning made us? The answer to that is in the word planning. It's all about planning. It's so much about planning that they call it planning. It's the plan, 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 plan. It's the view from above. And it's an abstract exercise in colored shapes on the map, building, and didn't neglect what architects always have done and what must what architects must do now. So that we want to earn the right to speak about a brief moment in human history when architects lost their way between 1950 and whenever we can responsibly date that we changed this, let's say 2025. So during those 75 years, architects lost track of the primary task, which was to design places for humans, for people. And what happened in those 75 years when we kind of had a mental breakdown, we blacked out and lots of irresponsible things happened. What happened? planning. We looked at things from above. We neglected the crucial component of the human scale experience on the street. Does that sound familiar? That language is at the core of your task of selecting an image for analysis. We want a low elevation, oblique aerial perspective, where in the foreground, we have access to a human scale activity, recognizable human scale activity, architectural experience in the foreground and the context of the urban fabric in the back. This analysis exercise is a prescription for overcoming that temporary insanity between 1950 and 2025, those 75 years of temporary insanity, to get back to the business of producing the stage set on which the trauma of human life plays out, which has always been in the tradition of architecture. And the spaces we make that we look at in history have to do with the different scales of the human anatomy. What is the scale of taste? Zero. It's like zero meters, zero feet. Have to help in your mouth. 
touch. It's not two feet to touch. Smell, maybe four feet. Hearing, depends on how loud the sounds are. What's the scale of hearing? 50 feet? If it's a sporting event? If it's a concert, if it's a Billy Eilish concert in the Stadium, it's bigger. What's the visual scale of our sense of sight? Our sense of sight is the largest. And Jan Giel, man uh, who, whose name you should know by now, when when he sends you uh, clip video clips on WhatsApp, do you watch it? How many of you watch Jan Giel's video? Let's be honest. <laughs> Okay, so sorry. So you should watch it because what this man has to say should infuse everything you do during your careers. It's a foundational understanding of human space. This is the scale of visual. Uh, those of you who will travel in Europe will notice that the most successful public places are at the scale that you can take in in the human perception of about 100 yards or 100 meters. This is the Noli map of Rome. Remember this? You've seen this? We've seen this. Okay. It's a figure ground, but it's more than a figure ground. It's a figure ground that has been augmented by the yellow. We're familiar with capitalism in the 20 late 20th century wants you to be comfortable there only being two things, the individual and the public, private and the public. But what, what that's a symptom of the insanity of 1950 to 2025, to overcome that moment of insanity in history, we need to grasp a third realm. It is not totally private and it's not totally public. It's the gradations between public and private. We don't really have a good language for it. We might call it semi-public, semi-private, but this is what it looks like the Noli map has established it. It's a way of documenting uh, the spatial experience of places that are inside, but I'm comfortable just walking in. Do you know these places? What's that? Pantheon, yes. This is Copenhagen. Uh, Weldon Priest used to teach here. Weldon Priest, uh, for 15 years, taught Studio 5, I think, that was the urban studio. We don't have it anymore. But for the first six weeks of the urban studio, students drew with pencils for six weeks as groups. This is a group project. Six weeks painstakingly drawing important streets as architecture. It was a very profoundly transformative exercise where uh, students started to think about public places as an architecture, as if it were a single conception like a building, but it's a street. That's the scale that has been missing. That's the scale where architects need to move into and operate on the scale of streets. Even as we design for our clients building a parcel, we need to design in a way that completes the ensemble of the hierarchy, public, private, and semi-private and semi-public spaces. We need to think of it like this. Uh, one of the goals of this analysis assignment is to get at the core principles that Weldon's exercise worked on over the scale of six weeks, we're trying to compress that learning experience into six hours. Instead of six weeks, six hours, and do it every week. That's the goal of the analysis assignment. <clears throat> it produced some tremendous work. So let's very quickly move through the three things. So you, you'll notice here, the quotation marks, where it says radiant garden city beautiful. What, who are we quoting when we say radiant garden city beautiful? You're quoting, not surprisingly, quoting Jane Jacobs. 
In older versions of the discourse where we start with Chata Al-Madur in Turkey and move through human history, we would spend a whole week on Sidi which would be a revisitation of a whole week we did on Roman or Renaissance urban design. <clears throat> then the next week, we'd spend a whole week on garden cities. And the next week, we'd spend a whole week on Corbusier's ideas about the radiant city. And each one of these uh, topics is a huge diagram, plan-based abstraction. That's the, uh, the, the fundamental DNA that shared in common between City Beautiful Movement, the Garden City Movement, and the Radiant City. Those three uh, big set of ideas about cities all share in common a plan view dominated by an abstract diagram. Jane Jacobs ridicules these three, these ideas that are diagrammatic and looking from above in plan view by being out of scale to the way humans experience the city. She lumps them all together in this joke, this ridicule. She ridicules all three of these uh, abstract planning visions by lumping them all together into a single idea, the radiant garden city beautiful. And she says something that is very cutting to the core of who we are as architects and designers. Even if, and this is, this is the big challenge to your generation, even if we're critical of the radiant city, garden city, city beautiful, when we're in a pinch, we tend to reproduce what we know. When we don't know what to do, we kind of replicate the things that are familiar to us. When your parents, when you are a parent and your children are, and I hope you will be, uh, when your children are like putting you on the ropes and you don't know what to do and you're overwhelmed, all of a sudden you'll hear a voice say something and you'll look around and say, are my parents here? And you'll realize in horror that it was your voice. You just said exactly what your parents would have said in that same situation. Does that sound familiar? No matter how critical we are of our parents, if we don't have a better way, have a well-rehearsed better way, and we are at risk simply in moments of, of weakness, of replicating the mistakes of our parents. We don't want that. Who wants, who wants that? No one wants that. Oh, we don't want that. So, these are the things that drove the, the design of cities. Here's Edmund Bacon, Kevin Bacon's dad, drawing Rome, the visual corridors of Rome, uh, cutting through the streets of Rome uh, by Pope Sixtus V in order to allow uh, Christian pilgrims to visit the holy sites and get indulgences and so they don't have to stay in purgatory so long. Um, and those ideas, we're seeing again in the 17th century of the Palace of Versailles. And then we see it in the transformation of Paris, Auslan's Paris. We don't have time for this. There were seven things. Uh, they cut through the slums. Does that sound familiar? If we're thinking about race and how the highways of the American interstate highway system, when they hit the city, they plowed through the neighborhoods, including this neighborhood, to clear the non-white residents out of the city, they did the same thing in Paris in the 19th century, 100 years earlier, to create a place that's safe for rich people to, to promenade and to be see, see and be seen at the Paris Opera. And you create these visual corridors with grand monuments at the end. It was pretty cool, but watch out it can cause more problems than they solve. You saw all this. The train stations, the parks, the real estate ideas. Now we get to the Ringstrasse in Vienna. This is an interesting case where they did the same thing. They made these huge public spaces where the medieval walls used to be. 
and it was a grand promenade for wealthy people. And then uh, Camilo Cite said, these spaces are inhumanely large. Camilo Cite cri criticized these grand spaces of, of visual grand or of display of beautiful monumental architecture. And he said, too big, it's out of scale, the human experience, we need to fill in these vast spaces, create housing and amenities at a scale that creates public rooms of the street. Street as a room, the outdoor rooms of the street where social life can thrive. So this was not built, but this was an important reference point for an architect trying to reclaim the scale of the city for people. Oops, I'm going on the direction. Then we did that in the United States uh, with the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, the, the World Columbian Exposition, grand architecture set back at the end of these visual corridors and it was called, called the White City and every city in the United States said, we want some of that. And so they cleared out parts of the city and they created this grandiose Renaissance architecture in order to reinforce the idea that Greece was the source of, of Western civilization and Rome built it up. And then we ignored the hundreds of years where where Islam uh, was the great civilization of the world and actually maintained connection to Greek and Roman civilization in their libraries and universities. And then it was Europe's turn. Europe claimed Paris, London, Germany, were all the, were now the heirs of the great Western civilization. In Chicago in 1893, the uh, a bunch of uh, business owners said, it's our turn. We're the rising superpower in the world. We need to claim our, stake our claim to being the banner carriers for Western civilization. How are we gonna do this? When you wanna take over the, uh, the control of Western civilization, who are you gonna call? The architects. The architects. Ghostbusters are not gonna help in this situation. <laughs> So you call the architects. What do the architects do? They say, oh yeah, we can do this. We have a little uh, Renaissance stuff. We can do this. And the architecture is the point of the spear. What comes after it is education. If you went, if you know someone who went to school in Illinois, in the public school system in Illinois in uh, the 1900s, in the 20th century. Chances are they took a class in high school and this was the textbook. So it wasn't just the architecture of these grand buildings, it was also the grand plan for the expansion of Chicago. But it wasn't just the architecture and the plan of Chicago. The civic principles embedded in the architecture and plan of Chicago were translated into a textbook. And that was translated into a high school class. The quizzes and tests, and to make sure that every high school student in the state of Illinois was learning these principles of civic responsibility uh, that is the uh, birthright of America. It happened in San Francisco, it happened in Washington, D.C. Cleveland has a beautiful example. And then uh, a similar strategy was employed by um, this really mediocre art student in Germany who felt he was victimized. He, he felt a very severe sense of victimization. He applied to architecture school and was rejected. He was very bitter about that. He always wanted to be an architect. He was bitter about a lot of things. And so he kept designing as he became elected to chancellor of the German parliament. He designed this flag. He designed these uniforms. He uh, designed this freeway system. He designed this car called the Volkswagen, the car of the people. He's there at the 
at the uh, and he partnered with Albert, Albert Speer, who was a trained architect, and they redesigned Berlin to be the seat of empire for the next thousand years. Uh, and this cute little replica of the Pantheon, the dome is so high you could fit the Empire State Building inside it. This Arc de Triomphe, this copy of the Arc de Triomphe from the Champs Elysees, is three or four times larger than the Arc de Triomphe. Jean say say the, the scale of it uh, was so monumental. Uh, it was then an instrument to power in colonial India. And we're going to talk about this next week. So I'm moving ahead. So that's the Garden City. The, the City Beautiful Movement was all about visual axes, monumental architecture, huge spaces. And it was an instrument of power. That's what you should remember. The Garden City was a little different. Ebenezer Howard was a court stenographer, but he was a big fan of uh, planning ideas. He said, cities are too dirty and crowded. The countryside is too empty of people and entertainments and society. We need the best of both worlds. We need a garden city. And so he has lots of abstract diagrams, very appealing, very uh, attractive as a conceptual abstract diagram. When it finally gets implemented, it's no longer a garden city, it's a suburban town, something quite familiar to us with the idea of access to open space, but also access to a train station. And any cars that are involved, we try to keep the cars out uh, at the periphery of the neighborhood. And at the center, we put the elementary school to make it safe for our children, which is reasonable. And so this became the neighborhood unit idea as it was implemented in England and the United States in the 1920s. This one is actually quite brilliant, the Radbury plan, where every house had driveway connected to a cul-de-sac that, that took the male uh, paid employee would take him off to his workplace. And then there's a second front of the house for the female non-paid non -paid worker of the household. And the children, they had their <laughs> own front of the house with no cars. It was safe. These paths lead all the way to the elementary school. So, and this is something that actually is worth uh, tattooing on, I don't know, a calf muscle. Do the, the, the same principle of the 15 minutes. Yes, same principle as 15 minutes. So 15 minute city, remember that. Another, I don't know if you have room to tattoo lots of things. But the first thing to tattoo, maybe on your calf, my daughter does tattoos. If you're interested, I can set you up. Uh, is cities that work for children and old people are good cities. That's a little long. She probably shortened it because it hurts. She does the old fashioned thing. <clears throat> That's a little too long. But shortened that cities that work for children and old people are good cities, which, in contrast to what we're about to see, the court Boussier said, Corbusier said, don't tattoo this. Uh, Corbusier said, Cities built for speed are cities that built for, built for success. Not true anymore. Cities that are built for speed are a recipe for suburban is a sprawl. Zoning. Zoning is the fundamental tool of racist segregation in the United States. We know zoning is the problem, but we can't get rid of zoning. Sorry about that. Our generation has failed utterly and completely of replacing zoning. The only thing we can do is add another zone on top of the old zones. And this new zone is called mixed use zone, mixed use district. <clears throat> mixed use districts or transit oriented development districts overlays that eliminates the zoning restrictions that came before. 
So the only thing we only tool we seem to be able to come up with to undo the problems of zoning is called zoning. It's still zoning. And it, these are the colored maps that planning imposes on onto spaces. So the third and final culprit here is Corbusier's uh, radiant city ideas. He was inspired by a convent uh, that he visited in Italy when he was younger. And the experience of living in this monk's cell at the monastery became the, the DNA of his multifamily dwelling ideas that were then assembled uh, as modular units into towers, mid-rise and high-rise towers. It became the core DNA of the, uh, the, the Marseille Unité d'Habitation or Unity, Unité Habitation, I guess we would say in English, I don't know how we do it. But it's Unité d'Habitation in Marseille and um, it became the core building block of modernist city expansion. And speaking of Alice Hayward Taylor houses, uh, the key thing about this type of housing, uh, this type of planning, is it was based on the architecture of these housing blocks. The recipe for this radiant city architecture and urban form is design the unit, aggregate those units into slabs and towers, and then place those object buildings in space. Do not design the space, place the, design the objects and place those objects in space. What is left over is left over. It's left over space. It was deliberately designed to not produce designed spaces. Those are streets and we had to get rid of our streets. And instead we have motorways that go between the field of object buildings. And any space that's left over, you plant it with grass. And if you need parking, you dig up the grass and put that on asphalt and park. So this is the idea of towers in the park, also, uh, parking, towers in the parking. And this is the radiant city diagram. We don't have a lot of good uh, versions of it, but it's um, it very deliberately, the brilliant idea of Corbusier, the radiant city, he will recall because he studied this, are the four functions. Dwelling is one function, working is the second function, and recreating is the third function. And you must separate them in separate zones. Function use zones. If one function use per zone. So dwelling goes over here, <clears throat> working goes far away from the dwelling. And then recreation is a third place way over here. And what's the fourth thing? Circulation, which uh, for most of the dark years between 1950 and 2025 has been interpreted as high-speed roads for cars. So single use zoning, functional use zoning was the principle and you separate them in space necessitating a lot of driving, a lot of, um, and so this explains, we're going back in time. Now that explains the automobile dependency that we were looking at a week ago. <clears throat> Kevin Lynch is worth mentioning. Kevin Lynch comes on the scene the same time as Jane Jacobs. And uh, he was at MIT. He taught a course uh, at MIT that was the longest running version of his course ever. And did you take that course? The, uh, I don't know. So um, I took that course. I taught versions of that course. Most, I, I'm going to, like a huge number of courses on uh, cities for architects are taught by people who took some version of that course, either taught by Kevin Lynch or its successor, Julian Byron. And that course uh, 
is the one that keeps, keeps getting replicated and taught in, in architecture programs all around the world. It ends at around 1960. Actually, this, this is the first class topic that overlaps with topics taught, taught in that version of the course. So if there were two courses, this course and one other course being taught at the same time in the old way, this is the week where there finally be some overlap between what gets taught in the old version of this course and the new version of this course. It's the way in Garden City, beautiful topics. Mm -hmm. um, but Kevin Lynch came on the scene at MIT and he said, wait a minute, how do humans experience the space of the city? Which is a brilliant question. It's the same question that Jane Jacobs is asking. But uh, when Kevin Lynch asked the question, his answer was five, five ways. We experience districts, landmarks, edges, nodes, and circulation. I, I might be getting uh, yeah, five. Path, path. And so that's how we experience it. And he did mental mapping research that uh, discovered that that's how humans experience. Do you think that it's justifiable, right? Yeah. But the big difference is that Gabriel Lee's proposal to extract this data from Berlin to people and not from your uh, visual analysis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you did this. So this is a slight improvement because even though it's being represented in a plan again and a diagram, at least he's asking the right question. How do humans experience the space of the city? Now, the key thing as I whiz through this is that the main thing that occurred in the utopian modernist city is that we got rid of the street and we replaced the street with a motorway. So basically, objects in space, architecture produces the objects in space. They're placed with lots of space between them so that there's room for motorways and grass. And if you need parking, dig up the grass, put in asphalt. And so we are now moving through a world of architectural objects and it works fine as long as you never get out of your car until you get to where you're going. And so we get places like Brasilia, which you studied, I think, uh, with these visual corridors. So this is the scale of visual access. So we visually see these beautiful architectural objects in the distance. And we move at 60 miles an hour through this landscape of beautiful architectural objects. And it works great. Until you get out of the car, it's too hot and too far. Kill me now. Don't make me walk all the way there. Then there's Chandigarh, did the same thing. Then there's New York City. It used to have the space of the street and cities all around the US, including this part of this city, you tear down the old defunct architectural buildings that create these tight street walls, you clear it out and you put objects in the grass. And this is what happened to the neighborhood I used to live in, um, in New York City. My house is on here somewhere. Okay, and now to the punchline, um, team 10 started to offer alternatives. This is um, one of the videos we sent. William H. White. was about William, William H. White. White. Public spaces because of a seminar with and study of human behavior in urban mm -hmm. settings. For nearly two decades, one has been observing how people use streets and public spaces. Although city is about the design and management of urban spaces, White's true fascination is with the life and rituals of people out on the streets. For him, the street is a stage. So we don't have time to go into that, but there's a video documentary 
uh, connected on WhatsApp. I strongly encourage you to watch this. We used to make it the focus of a big idea talk freshman year, so it could be the underpinning of everything we do in architecture from that point on. It should be. Uh, it's not. This is a book we used to require every student to purchase. It's listed in the syllabus. How many of you have it? Thank you. Two, three. <clears throat> Great. Check. Ask to look at this book. Uh, it's written by someone who used to teach at Wentworth and a colleague of mine who uh, was at MIT. Um, complete streets, walkability, 15-minute city. Uh, Jan Giel, I encourage you to, to watch that um, and his sense of uh, spaces. Let's, let's turn the corner to participatory design. There's lots of stuff here, including Peter Calthor. Well, let me add to the... <clears throat> I sent that video as well. Who's watched the Peter Calthor TED Talk? Uh, it's full of solutions that will help you navigate the challenges of your careers. And it may help you uh, produce a fantastic 16 out of 16 analysis this week. So let's look at participatory design. And uh, I lived in a self-produced neighborhood uh, when I found myself doing research in Southeast Asia and it was just a convenient place that I could afford to live, and it was pretty cool. Later, I, I found out that everything I was learning about the self-produced neighborhood actually uh, constituted some really interesting strategies for uh, self-producing as a strategy for city making in different situations. And the most fascinating thing is the interplay between the physical built environment and the social customs. It turns out that certain social practices cannot, will not, do not exist unless there is an associated built environment practice. When we get together with our neighbors, and we produce, physically produce our neighborhood, when we physically produce our uh, streets, when we physically produce our co-housing community in Cambridge, when we are socially engaged as a mechanism for physically producing a built environment, we are embedding those physical environments with the values and principles of our social community. So there is an in, Un unbreakable linkage between social principles and values and the way they are enacted through not just producing those environments, but living in those environments. And there's a lot of anthropological evidence that supports that this is the way things have happened throughout human history until architects and planners removed it to the <laughs> professionals and disempowered local communities from having anything to do. <clears throat> Don't, there, there, there. Don't worry your pretty little heads about this. The white male planners will take care of this for you. You're welcome. But right? that's the uh, patronizing attitude that has caused so many of the problems. Not surprisingly, the solution is to democratize the planning and construction of our built environments through participatory exercises in planning, designing, and actually constructing. So this was the focus of a program that Ignacio and I both participated in, in Caracas and Barcelona. And um, based on this uh, background of understanding self-produced communities, uh, something happened in two, at Christmas in 2004. There was an earthquake in, in the Indian Ocean and it sent, and it was the second largest earthquake in human history uh, that ever recorded. It sent a giant wall of water, a tsunami across the Indian Ocean and it decimated, uh, it decimated a community 
at the northern tip of Sumatra. And so I woke up Christmas, uh, the day after Christmas, hearing this news. I happened to be uh, in a camper on the beach in California saying, I hope the tsunami doesn't reach here. It didn't, thank you. But I said, wow, that's very serious, but it has nothing to do with me. I feel so bad for those people in Sumatra. Then I went to bed and I woke up the next day and I woke up with this realization, oh my God, it does have to do with me. I speak the language of those people in Sumatra. All of my professional colleagues of Indonesia are going to be participating in reconstructing these communities at the northern tip of Sumatra. I better go there. This is in response to a question that came up a few weeks ago. How do you end up being involved in some of these interesting projects all over the world? This is how it happened to me. A friend of mine from Australia, his girlfriend from Indonesia was a mental health worker. She was connected with uh, a nonprofit organization in Sumatra that was uh, going into the survivor camps uh, and trying to help them recover mentally from the distress of having their, their parents, their grandparents, their wives and their children wiped out and killed by this devastating earthquake and tsunami. 75% of the population of most of these villages were killed. The only one who survived were the males from 15 to 55 who were out in fishing boats and who could swim. Um, and so all of these male survivors were distraught, getting bitten by mosquitoes out in the camps and with nothing to do, the government was failing. They said, you cannot, it's illegal to resettle the coastline, it's too dangerous. Uh, we're going to put resort hotels there. It's a nonsensical statement, but that's what was happening. And people protested, and the government said, okay, you can go back and live where you were. So uh, we went there, and we asked them, what do you need? And the result was this village mapping and planning exercise. So we did a workshop at MIT. We had students from all over New England participating in this. There were about 70 students who wanted to go to Sumatra and help rebuild. Um, their universities said, no, we're not going to give you credit. No, we're not going to give you financial funding. And if you go, we might kick you out of school because if it's associated with our program, you get hurt, you're kidnapped. Uh, we won't be liable for it. But about 15 students went anyway, defied the warnings of their university. We went and we trained the survivors how to uh, map out their parcels. But since there was no one, uh, there, were, there were a lot of people who were never gonna live there, uh, either because they were too frightened to live close to the shore or they, uh, they were dead. So uh, we had to figure out how to replace everyone's houses. We wanted to live there, but because it's a, a Muslim community, it's not cool. Friends don't live, friends live far away from the mosque. You have to live in your community of believers. So we had to take their land rights from over here and relocate it near the mosque and their neighbors and their social community of the faith. And so it was a land redistribution idea that uh, also involved improving the infrastructure. It was build back better. It was very successful. Um, uh, when, the, when the Australian, English, and American planners uh, got together and they said in my presence, we need to prevent people from rebuilding their houses because they won't do it right. Recognize the patronizing people are idiots. They won't do it right. We need to call out the military and we need to prevent people from rebuilding their homes. We said, that sounds like the extension of the state. Let's do the opposite of that. Uh, when international organizations were forbidden from supplying uh, residents, the, the, the survivors with building materials, Oxfam and other people, they would drive their trucks there at night, dump building materials, and then head out. They were just dumping building supplies in their neighborhood. 
<clears throat> trusting that people would use them to rebuild their communities. Uh, the governor of Aceh declared our plan to be the one they endorsed, and uh, village. There were hundreds of villages that remapped and replanned their towns, and then they rebuilt it themselves. And we published a comic book that trained people how to uh, mix cement in rock or concrete and steel reinforced uh, foundations so it would survive the, uh, the next earthquake tsunami. And so people were empowered by the architects rather than being disempowered by the architects. Very successful. Some of the ideas were built and that's it. Okay, that's a very mm -hmm. concrete example that ties together the theme this week and the theme of week 10, self-produced neighborhood week. Um, the ideas of the self-produced neighborhood proved crucial and vital to the empowerment of people in the rebuilding of their homes in the wake of disaster. This was declared one of the single most successful disaster reconstruction efforts ever. And it was partly because of the strategies of self-produced neighborhoods being employed. So uh, it's something that could be embraced and could actually be a guide for how we proceed in practice. Becoming. That's it. Me. Now you. Yeah. I'm sorry. You. Oh no. Menti. 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 Yeah. So. <clears throat> how do you? So after, let, let me start saying that <clears throat> the so these presentations that I'm gonna start today finish next week. So it's, a, it's one presentation divided into fragments. So if I am watching in a moment, I'm okay because I can stop many time and I continue next week. Because if I will be talking about participatory planning and spatial democracy. And there are two topics that comes in pair. And I have to be uh, like really honest with you. This is a presentation that I usually give to mayors and to politicians. It's not a presentation prepared for architects. So I don't know if you know that I have another, another uh, path. I used to be uh, a consultant for politicians about how to improve spatial democracy. This is my main job, actually. That is my main job. And I, but, but I have a friend who said that I am two architects to be a politician and two politicians, and, and two politi politicians, to, sorry, two architects to be a politics, a guy, and, and two politicians to be an architect. So I'm always in these two fights. Actually, I have to say that I'm here because I was involved in politics. So the reason because I'm here is because I, I was working in a public space, one self produced environment in Caracas, and I received a threat call from the government, the same government that he came from, and he says, if, they, if you continue dealing with this stuff, you will, your family, who lives right there, right there, and right there, will be killed. So I have to leave the country. So I strongly believe in the relationship in architecture, <coughs> urban design, and politics. And politics. So, so put percent. So, but please. So Robert was talking about participation. So he transitioned from the top view, black perspective of planning, through the importance of participation. Please write your hand if you have any idea about participation. Any anything you about know, participation? Nothing. You have any idea? Okay, right. Great. So we want to start this session with your contribution to the final presentation. So please go to www.menti.com and put that code or scan that QR code. So you can put any amount of words. I just ask you please to put just words, not sentences, just words, single words. And try to spell that well. Because we're doing a work lab together. So, and obviously, you start to see that the ones that are bigger is the ones that are um, more, more positive. So, if you see something that, it, for example, if you see involvement or involved, 
Again, it's the same thing, try to use the same word to see what is more important for, for, for this class. So we're having 50 responses, 60 responses so far. So we're having we're around 40 people here, 40 and five, we put five more. Uh, uh, 100, how many can you do the same after 40 times, five? Sorry? 200, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be happy when you have 200 responses. At least 200 responses, which means that everybody put at least five words. And then you have certain value in this survey. So what we're doing here is making a survey about what participation means. And, and in order to understand, or in, uh, in order to try to define the word, and we will do work today and next class in the definition of participation and the relationship between participation and democracy. And how, and, and I mean, especially how urban design and architecture and design have plays a role to connect uh, inequality <clears throat> through uh, through democracy. So how we can use design as a way to improve democracy through participation. That's quite interesting. So oh, that's very interesting. So the word contribution is so big here. So which means that we are architects. So and it's funny because I used to do this with different type of people. So I um, mean and with so with politicians the word contribution is not always that big. But when, when I work with communities, the word engagement is so big as well. It's going fast. We're almost there. I'm gonna start with this say 200, okay? You can put any 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 amount of words but at least five please team contribution, team engagement, involvement, together, the work together is important, working, engagement, conversation, eight. Who, who, write, who wrote eight? Raise your hand. Hey, what, what do you think eight? What, how do you connect eight with the word participation? Explain that a little bit. Uh, I was going to just sit in there. But I'll go deeper than that. Go deeper than that. So, eight. The participation, you're aiding. I don't know, I'm just thinking back to what Rob was talking about. He's participating in an aid effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so an aid, you, you think 200, you think about Who brought 200? Yeah, if you see any word that, that casts your attention, any word that you say, why is it work? Yeah, well, it's a piece. I'll say voice. Voice. Say the word voice. Who say the word voice? Who brought voice? So as I told you, I I use the I use the search. There's a lot of stuff there. Please put more two hundred. Everybody I can take her. That is very important. So Josiah, you want to say something? No, this is good. Team 200, yeah, more 200, please. We <laughs> want to, but yeah, throw it up. Six times. Okay, so I'm going to go with Okay, let's, let's continue. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to come back to this, to this phrase. If you don't mind, please, can you take a photo of this? Dr. Farm. Now, uh, uh, and I want to please to send this photo to WhatsApp. And I promise that I will do that in the video okay? Please send this photo to WhatsApp. <laughs> so, I might need to reopen. I don't know if I couldn't find it to be uh, the, the... Ah, okay. So, so we have to go Somehow to... it closed. So, so, yeah. so as I told you, let me explain what I did with this story. I was, I was, I was very lucky that well, I, I believe about an organization called the Tarlatan Foundation. It's an organization who got a grant for ten five years. So since since 2020, we were traveling around different cities talking about participation. 
and doing the same story across different with different stakeholders, different groups of people. So, so this is the last year of the grant, and we're doing we're basically writing a report about what how participation what participation is perceived around the world in order to build participatory plan. So let me start saying there are several concepts that helps me to define the growth. <clears throat> that help me to define particip participation or participatory plan. Next. Okay, so the, fir the first two words are innovation and productivity. So please, I want your, your contribution here. Why do you see a project, any architectural project, let's say, it could be we can have more innovation or more productivity with the input participation? So, why do you see? A participatory project could be more productive, or it will have more innovation. Let's start with, yeah. I guess kind of both here involving the process. So, inevitably, <coughs> someone would find a solution to the problem that no one has been So, on the big side, you have more people actively working on the project. So, you can do it faster. Makes sense. Yeah. Sensation. Any, any other comment here, please? Uh, like different people uh, tackle different challenges, like in different ways. So if you guys are all kind of doing it, the same challenge again. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that happened to you. You're in the studio working your desk, and you're trying to speak the idea for your project. I suddenly just stand up and go to the hall or go to the vending machine, and you talk with someone. That is the moment where the idea came to your mind. So that is very common. And that's the reason because, for example, Google. For many years ago, they decided to change the way they designed their business, their offices. Instead of having a traditional office where you have a desk, you have pool tables, a uh, lot of vending machines, basketball court, and uh, uh, gaming sessions to produce. If they realize that if you change the setting, you can be more innovation. You, you can produce more innovation and be more, uh, more creative. So this is what is called the science thing. It's fun because we are the science and the business field, they took the idea of the design thinking, but they are producing tons of books about the science thinking, they are applying science thinking, and we are the owners of this idea that we produce everything through design, we're not taking this idea to, to, to contribute to the world. But basically, participation, you expand, as they say, you expand the amount of stakeholders, and in the expansion of this in the amount of the stakeholders, you can you can maxim, uh, maximize the ideas that you have. Actually, there is a professor from Stanford University, Nicholas Blunt. He was studying teleworking for a while, even before COVID. He, he had like 20 years working with teleworking. And he after after working with several, especially Chinese companies who worked with teleworking, he concluded that. In teleworking, you can produce more, but you are less creative. So you can you can produce more and more and more, but you have less creation. Why? Because you are alone. So gathering with others in order to produce more creativity. And, and 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 but at the same time, participation could be more productive because it's it use it has more efficient use of the resources. And listening to me, this is very important when you talk, when you work with communities and with offices outside. I have a lot of work with with, with public agencies, actually this is my jobs working with public agencies. And and one issue that happened with urban environments is that the amount of problems, listen to me, this is kind of my 20%. The amount of problems that you have to address are infinite. Infinite are enormous if you compare that with the amount of money that you have. It's always infinite. So even if you have a lot of money in your hand, the amount of problems, of ideas, sort of needs that you have to address is it's enormous compared to that amount of money. So participation is a tool to have, have a better allocation of these resources because you can ask, you can investigate, you can assess. The real needs of different people, putting them together and allocate the money exactly where the people need to be found. 
you cannot do that alone. You cannot do that alone. You can only do that with you if you include the needs, the boys, and the resources of, of, of different people. So, and also <clears throat> participation includes a lot of things. So I think three, these three lines of, of circles only define what you have to do with what is participation. So the first one is the importance of expand the stakeholder. <clears throat> and let me tell you an anecdote about that. I was working in a self-produced environment in the time. We were working with students, sport partners, sport partners, and and it was a big field. Anyone, anyone hundred uh, square meter. So it's like the size of soccer fields. Who was like a junkyard. Yeah. And we were asked for the community to build that, to transform that junkyard into a public field, in the public park. And we discovered that the community say that they don't want that. What about that? It was weird. So we went to the mayor of the place, and after several times participatory meetings, we discovered that the drug dealers of this space have this, the, the headquarters of drug, drug distribution in that one. So they didn't want us to do it, but they were lost very long. Oh, surprise, surprise. So the community were basically drug dealers. So what we did, so basically, I, mean, I did it that a lot. I did, the mayor was a really bald guy. He decided to expand the cycle. So let's invite not only to the, that person who define them as a community, Let's invite also the voters, the soccer teams, the people who have managed the, the caps, the, the owners of the, of the restaurant that are close by. We invite a lot of people to the next meeting. So we expand to the same order. And in that moment, we have more needs than only the needs of the drug dealer. So we can, and the, and the mayor say, okay, raise your hand if you don't like to transform the junk yard in the only part. So obviously, in that moment, we just find the stakeholder, for dealers were the minority. And we were able to approve this. So, be careful because we, we work with participation. Sometimes, the people who say that your, your community is not a real community. So, expanding the stakeholder is a very important thing, what this first circle means. The second thing is that <clears throat> a good participatory project, actually, any or project, cycles are very important. You have to do to investigate, to define, to implement, to evaluate, to investigate. So the cycle is very important. You cannot do everything from scratch. So and, and so then evaluate what you have is very important. I have already the strength, weakness, opportunities, and breadth of the project is very crucial. So do not believe that you can do a particular project from scratch. And any any other project from scratch, you have to start testing what is happening. But in any case, so the main message that we're having here is that from the Radian City, everything that Robert said, where you have the God of the architect trying to, to organize everything from, from a top-down perspective, there was a, uh, and, 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 that, and, and, and this is the CM grid. You know what a CM means? You know that because you were in the studio in, in history and theory for Congress, International Inter American Con International Congress of, Ar of, of Modern, Modern Architects. They created this idea of the CM grid, where you have a grid of things that you have to do, a, and a standard to control the way you design cities through diagrammatic top view ideas. And in that moment, where they were, uh, in, especially in 1968, I'm, I'm trying to connect the dots. So here, I don't know if you remember when we were talking about the right the city in week seven, we talked about 1968 at the moment where this amount of protest happens. So you have a lot of protest of people trying to demand more participation in, in decision making. And one of the these are basically posters of this protest that happens in French in May 1968. And the most beautiful for me is the last one that says in, in French, the beauty is in the street. So one of the main ways to protest against systems, asking for more participation of people's voice into decision-making was remembering that the beauty is in the street. And this is basically the first slide that Roberts uh, pushed today. And, and I don't want to go deep in this, 
because Robert was telling a lot about that. And, and, but here in the, in the United States, one of the big protests happens because of this amazing lady who was Jane Jacob. We were talking that we have to launch a Jane Jacobs Award, a national Jane Jacobs Award. So imagine you have an award when women are celebrated for, for thinking out of the box, thinking something that traditional male thinkers cannot think. Because in my opinion, that was like the beginning of, of, of this particular process by Jane Jacobs. And that was the foundation of urban design. I don't know if, the, I don't know, if you know this story, but in 1965, in, 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 at the GSD, in the Harvard Grad School of Design, there was the first urban design conference. And they decided to put together different designers, these guys, Christopher Alexander, Gordon Poole, and Kevin Lins, just a research. They were all together in ESD. They were all white male guys, except for Jane Jacobs. And there was, and, and also she was a character. Yeah. So she was a character. She was a really strong voice. She, she, she was a journalist. And, and also, I don't know, it's like a tiny lady with these big glasses. So she's, she's like, a, like a beautiful character. And but she kicked the ass, sorry for all of these guys who were thinking, uh, sorry, uh, architecture diagrammatically. So even the case of Kevin Lee, who was an amazing diagram, who was thinking of mental health, he couldn't think the, the city without diagrams, as mostly top view diagrams. And in that moment, came Jane Jacobs to say, we can think in a different way. We can also increase, increase the voice of the people because the beauty is, is in the streets. So there was a game changer, then Jacobs, when she introduced this idea into the into the into the uh, um, in, in the in the first urban design conference, the first one that was the the beginning of urban design as a concept. So we cannot now imagine urban design without the participation of the people. And as we were describing last week, she was one of one uh, person who battled was the uh, this big confrontation between Bob Moses was this guy who create highways to tear down slums in Manhattan and all over or in, in every time place in America. Bronx. And it's in Bronx, sorry, yeah. And against Jane Jacobs. I have to say something. I used to teach this class in, in Monterrey, Mexico. And in Monterrey, that is they are studying Robert John Moses and Jane Jacobs. So every part of that, that became an icon of urban design. Every part of the world studied the importance of this confrontation between the guy who created a new form of 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 uh, of design top down diagrammatically from the top view versus the importance of including the voice of the people into into, the, into decision making and this is also becoming a, a, a trending in broadway mm -hmm. so that was so that there were a, a place around the world discussing these trends if you want go to this and you can see the play by where, so this is Ralph Fiennes. You know Ralph Fiennes? You know that actor? He's a Hollywood actor. He plays Bob Moses in that play in London. So, and from that emerged a new forms of planning that was called advocacy planning. Understand this is a, a very famous text by Paul Davidoff. I, I don't know if this is true, but there are certain rumors that, that Paul Davidoff readings were written by Linda Davidoff. I don't know if this is true. They have to be confirmed. But, but there is a gender issue here as well. So there is a first moment where women start to play a role in planning because they were thinking it from a different way. So Jane Jacobs has to be a woman to think, participate, uh, to think planning in a different way, including advocacy planning. And also Paul Davidoff couldn't do that without Linda. Uh, uh, and, and, and basically what advocacy plan is says that you have to be an advocate of change if you want to be a planner. So, and, and, and among all of these books, for me, the most important one, the one that changed the history of participation was this text by Cherry Einstein. One year after 1968, the same year that we had Woodstock, the same year that we, the they, they, they men go way to the moon, so you, and, and is the reading, who write that book? Who write the text for, for today? Because I 
want to spend the time that it, that, it, that, that remains today to discuss this ladder. And I will continue with the lecture later. So, so we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes is a good time to discuss this ladder. So, so basically what she's saying, and this is, I have to say, a, 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 a Marxist frame, that supposedly, if you are in the lower part, so these are different steps, actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps of the ladder of production. If you are in the lower part of the ladder, you are not really creating participation. She called that manipulation of therapy as non-participation. So this is not really participation. Let's start with that. So imagine that you go to a community and you say, come here, look at this project, look at this amazing render. You cannot do this render because I can't do the render. It's beautiful, right? Okay, sign this letter and approve this. What she said is that this is, you can manipulate people through amazing drawings without really listening their needs and resources and their capacity and without really incorporating their, their ideas. And this is a kind of manipulation that is not really participation. And this is the most frequent way that you have to. And that's what architects do? This is what architects do. So do you do participation? Yes, we did it. We present our project. So imagine that you are an underprivileged nation. You live in an underprivileged nation. You have no idea how to build a project. You have no idea how to create uh, a render. And there is a guy that came comes to the neighborhood with an amazing render that looks amazing. You say, do you like that? Yes, of course. OK, build it. Okay, buy me that, because uh, do it that, and you, and you have to sign the paper, you approve that thing. So you can manipulate through your project. So how we, the, the question about Cherry Army is, it's not enough just to ask people or to show people the things, but how we can integrate with their project. Okay, <laughs> 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 we'll continue with that next slide.